Ta Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu Bevisvatav, Bitzvenu, Eshmoa, Ko HaShofar. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Yahweh, our Elohim, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by his commandments, his commandments to heed, hear, or listen to, and obey the voice or the sound of the Shofar, the Ramshorn. <laughs> Saturday in the traditional uh, we're going to talk about tradition versus what the Bible says in paganism <laughs> what? no 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 so today is when according to the traditional calendar which is inaccurate we'll talk about that when Jesus uh, he's in the netherworld right and uh, Robert did a teaching on that uh, what do they call it the descensus descensus descent into Descent into hell. Let's do it that way. Right? They actually talk about this in the Apostles' Creed. And a lot of people are confused about it. Right? He descended into hell. But we recognize that Yeshua did not descend into hell as a victim, but as a conqueror. Right? And... Uh, Anyway, we're going to talk about the calendar, what's right, what's wrong, what people think. Uh, I'll probably talk, touch on that during the worship service. But I think this is a very important uh, concept and theme. And uh, the videos on the Descensus is on the YouTube channel. And we got Robert talking about that. One of the things I really liked about what he did is, I mean, this is a very big tradition in Eastern churches. And I think we have a picture of this icon on the wall, and it shows Jesus standing on the gates of hell, and he's got Adam on his, he's holding Adam's hand in his right hand, he's on his left, he's resurrecting them, you see the souls of the righteous dead behind him, and he's he's trampling on Satan, and Satan's hogtie underneath yeah. his feet. And that's a very popular image in Eastern Orthodox churches, it's probably one of the, you know, like we have the Last Supper, you know, in Christian art here in the West, and you know, or, or just the crucifixion. But in the East, that's a very popular image, and it's nothing new. Uh, there's these these churches, beautiful churches, and you know it's now Turkey that uh, uh, had that painting. It's called the Anastasis or the Resurrection. It's a church called Chora. I think it's somewhere near Istanbul. Uh, so what Robert talked when he's talking about that, he's, he's making two points. Uh, uh, a lot of this information is derived from, like I said, in, in the early church period. This was a very popular theme. Uh, we see it in, uh, actually, probably the original uh, gospel of, of uh, this Bartholomew's, Bartholomew's gospel. It's probably gone, but we have two versions, I think, questions of, of uh, Bar Bartholomew and then Bartholomew on the resurrection. They're very similar. So they probably came from the original gospel of Bartholomew, which is lost. We have these two works that which were derived from it. And uh, both of those books deal with you know, Jesus, uh, Yeshua, Dying on the cross, then he goes in, in, into the netherworld, the hell, and conquers you know, death, hell, and the grave. Mentions that in the book of uh, uh, the book of uh, uh, Revelation. So we have the two versions of the Gospel of Bartholomew. We also have what's called the Acts of Pilate, which is found in the Gospel of Nicodemus. And uh, there are versions of Apocrypha that are available to the general public. I mean, if you get a King James version, there's a lot of you know a 1611 King James version. A lot of the Apocryphal books are in the middle. But there's a two-volume set. It's called The Lost Books of the Bible and then The Forgotten Books of Eden. That's a good set. And The Lost Books of the, the Forgotten Books of Eden, the Old Testament Apocrypha, and The Lost Books of the Bible, that's New Testament Apocrypha. Right. And the Acts of Titus are found in the Gospel of Nicodemus. It's very, very interesting. Uh, but what Robert, and I recommend you go and watch this, uh, this series of video, because Robert shows that this isn't, uh, this is entirely biblical. Like in, especially the Gospel of Matthew goes into detail, and then Second Peter goes into detail about Jesus going into the, in another world. So this isn't something like a, like I mentioned. 
Uh, what's that? Next, the reference to Jonah is Jonah was three days in the belly of a whale, so the son of man would be three days in the Right, right. We'll talk about that. Um, but uh, we have the idea of, of, of Jesus, Yeshua, uh, yeah. going to the netherworld. And there are some theologians that, I think it's Wayne Grudem, he's like, uh, you have systematic theology. And uh, he wrote a systematic theology where he's trying to, you have these two big famous creeds. One is the Apostles' Creed, the other is the Nicene Creed. And he's like, oh, the Apostles' Creed's wrong. Jesus didn't descend into hell. But he's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong because, like like Robert shows, this isn't just in these, uh, these so-called apocryphal texts. This is a biblical concept. And it was a very important theme in the early church uh, as well. And I want to have Robert come and talk about uh, uh, the Book of Enoch. And, and Jonathan was talking. We've got Dr. Wolf, who is a very big help. I mean, we, we defeated uh, Ernest Bales. He was very bad for our community. And even though I didn't win, what I did uh, was very important because we needed that guy out of there. And it was an important campaign. And between me and, and Janice Holt, we got 60% of the vote against Bales. We got him down to 38%. And uh, everything we did made a huge difference in bringing easy change to this community. And uh, Dr. Wolf is a big help in the campaign. And he's instrumental in my campaign, getting me my votes, but also in, in uh, uh, helping us defeat Ernest Bell. Uh, but, but Jonathan said he went to go see Dr. Wolf, and Dr. Wolf said, Hey, I've just been reading the Book of Enoch. It's a great book. <laughs> and, and by the way, he was giving the same answer as you were about how it was uh, quoted in the New Testament and how the New Testament was holding it up. I thought that was really fascinating. Uh, another thing that I thought was very interesting is the bones of St. Jude Thaddeus were here in Houston. Uh, the Catholic Church, you know, they kept his bones. They, they keep him in Rome. They brought him here to Houston. They had these books on the life of St. Jude Thaddeus. And uh, the Catholic tradition, there might be different people named Jude. We don't know for a certain. I think they had Jude Thaddeus and we have Jude the brother of Jesus and two different people. But the Catholic Church thinks that Jude Thaddeus is the author of the Epistle of Jude. It's unlikely in my opinion, but it's possible. So when I make a movie... I, you know, I just incorporate, I just go with the Catholic tradition, even though I have old, old, old doubts about it. But the Catholic Church had these books out on the life of St. Judah. I guess I took it, uh, I don't have it here with me, I got my two books on the, on the pulpit. But, I mean, that, that refers to Enoch uh, uh, very clearly. So, I'm going to let Robert come. I want to mention one thing. I think this is very interesting. Speaking about book of, the book of Enoch, uh, this is very, very strange how things work out. Tomorrow is Easter or Resurrection Day, right? Yes, sir. When's Passover? April 20th. And the Eastern Orthodox, they, they're they going to have Easter or Pascha. They don't call it Easter. They call it Pascha, which is more appropriate. And the Eastern Orthodox, they're going to have Pascha in May. <laughs> it's crazy. It's because it's leap year. Usually Easter and Passover fall around the same time. This year, that's incredible to me that... Each of the, the, the traditions are celebrating it a month apart. Hmm? I'm just remembering it at three different times. Yeah, yeah, that's three, three different times. But the the uh, there's this early group of Christians called the Quattro Decimans that observe the Passover, and there's a Messianic. Uh, to me, I think that's we need to go back to the early church period, especially if you have early Jewish Christianity, right? And there's an early Jewish Christian called Melito of Sardis, and this is a basic. This is basically, you know, according to this translator, a scholar, uh, a Messianic Jewish style Passover seder called uh, Peri Pascha or on the Passover. And the interesting thing about this this manuscript. So we have this ancient Messianic uh, Passover seder Haggadah from the year 160, and it's on the same manuscript. If you look at it, it says the Book of Enoch, and then it has uh, Peri Pascha. What does that tell us? Early Jewish Christians were, you know, they're keeping the Passover, they're keeping this, the Seder, and uh, they're reading the Book of Enoch because it's on the same manuscript. Uh, Melito of Sardis is uh, Peri Pascha. And uh, this is called the Quattro Decimans. That's Latin for 14th because they observed the Passover or Pascha in Aramaic on the 14th. And this has a collection of quotations of uh, about the Quattro Decimans. Of course, the Catholic Pope didn't like the Quattro Decimans were doing. You know, it's like, well, they said, this is how John the. John taught us to, to observe uh, it this way. So one of the, the writings that was used by the Quattro Decimans, or this early group of Jewish Christians, is called the, the Epistola Apostolorum. And uh, we're going to continue on the Book of Enoch for a couple of uh, uh, more Sabbaths, but I'm going to have uh, Robert take a look at that. 
But no, 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 no. We're going to have. Oh, okay. When does it actually start? Though, the actual I think it's Monday night. Yes, it starts that Monday. Night. So it's gonna be the twenty second or so. So. Yeah, we're gonna have. We're gonna do a Christ on the Passover for educational, you know, Bible study purposes, right? So it's supposed to be in the evening. We're gonna go through the meal. It's for instruction. We're gonna do it in the morning. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna let Robert go. I just want to say that he, he has other teachings about important concepts, right? Like, and today is the day where the, the greater Christian world. Most people, most people don't even think about it, but it's a deep subject. And and Catholics, they recite the Apostles' Creed, but they don't they don't think about it, understand what it means, and he just sent it into hell. So uh, just go back and look at what Robert taught about that. I think these concepts are also found in the Book of Enoch about the souls, and, you know, Jesus preaching the souls and uh, and Sheol. All right. Without further ado, we're gonna have Robert come and uh, teach us. Okay, great. So let's see. So I guess everybody's here who's usually here. So maybe we can make a little bit of progress today. I believe last uh, last time we left off the end of uh, chapter forty-eight, uh, beginning of chapter forty-nine. Um, just to kind of give us a little bit of context, I'll just read over it real quick. Um, and it says, "The strong who possess the lands because of the works of their hands." Uh, for on the day of their anguish and affliction, they shall not be able to save themselves. And we, we talked about the reason why this is the case. And that is because everything that they've taught has been founded on the, the, the fallacy that the apostles did not uh, read outside of uh, the, what they deem canonical or whatever. Uh, and uh, basically, when we when we read the refutation of that argument that's given to us in Peter and Jude, uh, it makes it very clear that what happened was when he says, for example, that we right did not follow cleverly concocted fables when we told you about the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Okay, so and this is Peter saying this, right? Okay, so we talked about how Jude evidently, uh, the authority and or the word of Jude, the testimony of Jude was evidently called into question because Jude made the appeal that the apostles taught these things. Um, and so you get this picture that, that Peter and the apostles went out to teach not just the power and the coming of the Lord, but specifically the book of Enoch because that quote is is uh, Enoch 1 9 which is the same as Jude 14 and 15 right so he says that when we went out and taught you about the power and the coming we weren't following cleverly concocted fables so this is really the crux of the problem is that the uh, evidently and I say evidently because this is there's evidence for this right evidently when they went out to preach the power and the coming it was from the book of Enoch so the, uh, the apostolic teaching evidently was uh, Enochian in nature and the appeal to other books outside of the canon uh, besides the book of Enoch is sort of seconded or brought forth by Jude who quotes the assumption of Moses and uh, perhaps um, Peter perhaps quotes outside of the canon as well but the idea is that because because Peter and Jude can be put together and understood in such a way as to create a mechanism for the return of the book of Enoch, right? Because if, um, because if Peter takes Jude, takes Jude and defends him, right? And they both make these claims that, um, that, uh, that, for example, when Peter says that, um, that, um, that prophets of old spake as they were moved of the Holy Spirit. Remember his usage of the term of old time? Right? Is with reference to the pre-flood world. So, the idea is that Peter is defending Jude. And Jude is defending Enoch. 
right? So when, when Peter speaks of the, the world of old in 2 Peter, he's talking about the pre-flood or antediluvian world, right? So when he also says prophets, right, of old, right, what does he mean? He means pre-flood prophets, right? And so Enoch was therefore a pre-flood prophet. So he's talking about the book of Enoch here. Yes. He's very specifically mentioning that. And it says that, that they were they spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right. So Jude calls him a prophet because he said Enoch prophesied. Right. And if, if we're reading P Peter as a defense of Jude, when he's saying that prophets of old, right, that, that no scripture is of any private interpretation, but prophets of old, prophets of the pre-flood world, right, meaning Enoch, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, right, he's pretty much, once you understand that that's actually what he's saying, then basically you start to see history as something of a, a deception, as something of a lie, because that is very specifically not taught. It's taught against. In fact, this book was given. So the idea is that that when he says that I will give him over to the hand of my elect, still in chapter 48, right? That's how. Because now they can't stand in the face of that fundamental logic. The, the, their, their logic fails at that point, and thus all of their assertions, everything that they've built. And there's different canons, right? But I mean, talking about the Protestant canons, for example, you know, the idea that there are 66 books, right? But that Enoch is not included, even though the the even though the prophets themselves are attesting. Peter says that prophets of old, prophets of antediluvian times, in other words, right, uh, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, right? Why is that not in here, right? So it means that this whole concept is not what the apostles taught, right? It just means that just on the face value of it, none of them are right, because none of them, well, except for the Ethiopic Church, of course, but no other church uh, has espoused this book, right? And so this is how they're to be given over to the hands of the elect, because everything that they've built was built on a lie, and so it kind of builds on that. And as straw in the fire, so shall they burn before the face of the holy, because you can see how quickly that illusion vanishes, and how quickly their power, therefore, which is built upon that illusion, right, vanishes as well, right? And so it makes sense. And as lead and water shall they sink before the face of the righteous. Again, the water is the word of God, so they have no... They have no basis on the word. They will sink, in other words. like. And so you kind of read it like this. You see it in terms of its symbolism. It says it's a parable. And no trace of them shall any more be found. And you can see why. Because at one point, once, they're, once the, the whole entire underpinning of their entire existence is done away with and dispensed with and seen through as an illusion, right? then again, there is no place for them anymore. They no longer have any authority because they have no standing. They have no standing because they're not stood on the word. In right. fact, they've stood in the way of the world. word. They've, they've, you know, where, where Jude said that, you know, he was, um, when Jude says, for example, that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, and he gives the, the, the quote, which is, again, the power and the coming, right? Because, again, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment, right, upon all these men. So that's the power and the coming. When we told you about the power and the coming, right, which is Enoch 1.9, right, we weren't following cleverly concocted fables. So it's not a fable, and it, therefore it is not a pseudepigraphon. Alright, so these are just fundamental things you got to understand when you understand how the book of Enoch interfaces with this world. Because Judah and Peter provide us with, again, the needed mechanism to return the book of Enoch to us. And the book of Enoch, of course, the very first thing it says about itself is the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. He took his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were open, God saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But again, not for this generation, but for a remote one which is to come. So he says two times, basically, 
Um, it's for the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation, and it's not for his current generation, but for a remote one, which again is at the time of the power, or the time of the coming of the Lord. Right? So it's a book that's going to be reintroduced into circulation in the church, and one which has been denied. And Peter and Jude afford us that, uh, that open door, if you will, uh, for this eventuality. It makes it possible. And it says, And on the day of their affliction, there shall be rest on the earth. Because again, the millennium uh, is, is the time of rest. Like the Sabbath is the day of rest. If the millennium is the seventh day, it is the day where you know we rest, if you will, in God, that we are at peace because we've been given the truth and we, you know, therefore no longer seeking for it in our unrest. Um, and before them they shall fall and not rise again, because again, everything they built on was an illusion. Once you see through the illusion, there's no continuance of it. It doesn't exist anymore. It's sort of gone away and vanished, right? So their teaching will have vanished. Um, and there shall be no one to take them up with his hands and raise them, because again, it wasn't done out of ignorance. What, is it, what does it say in the book of Peter about these men, right? Because it's these men have infiltrated the church. It's these men who've said that it's not the seventh from Adam, even though Jude says it is, so they're negating him. But he's not prophecy, even though Jude says he is, so they're negating him. So there's just, it's just negation after negation after negation of what Jude has said and subsequently what Peter has said, right? And so no one's going to take them with their hands and raise them because they have denied the Lord of the Spirits and his anointed, the name of the Lord of Spirits be blessed. So the idea is that, you know, the naming of him, again, the Old Testament names him in the sense that it speaks of his coming, you know, the coming Messiah, how he's going to be in suffering servant, Isaiah 53. Peter, I'm sorry, Jesus talks this, about this on the road to Emmaus to all the, peop the, the people who were with him. And he explains how he is a fulfillment of all that was in the Old Testament, yet their eyes were being held. It symbolizes how throughout the age we're going to be blind to his presence. He's going to be talking to us and explaining to us, and it's going to be burning in our hearts, right? But it's only after he disappears in the flesh or whatever and reveals himself in the breaking of the bread that they actually come to see. And so now, so now, that, the, now that the church is wise to all of this stuff and all the doors to these other scriptures are open up, and you understand that it's not yes and no, but it's just yes, right? Yes. And you're willing to accept that, yes, he's the seventh from Adam. Yes, he prophesied. You're willing to accept that, right? And once you're laying the, the, the way straight and you're making things straight for him, in other words, you're not blocking him by saying, no, he's not. He's not talking about that. He doesn't mean that. If you just say, yes, he means that. Yes, he says what he means and he means what he says, so to speak. Yeah. Right then, that that door of wisdom is open to you because now you're no longer blocking it. You're not confusing it with way, the way humans think or the way humans have taught. You're actually seeing it for what it is and speaking it for what it says. And then all of a sudden, the wisdom comes forth because it's been, in a sense, dammed up. It's been held back behind um, the limits that people have placed upon it. And it says, "And the glory faileth him not, um, not before him forevermore." Because again. Once you recognize that he has done this, you understand that he has the power over this age and has the power over our seeing and our not seeing, right? Um, and so again, he is mighty in all the secrets of righteousness because again, all things are bound up in Christ to be revealed in him, right? So in him lie all of these secrets, right? So once you recognize that one of the things we just talked about here was a secret that essentially that they, they went out preaching the book of Enoch. It's not something that's been told, but it's something that can be inferred from the text, right? So these are the kinds of secrets that are bound up in them. And once you start to affirm them and to see them, you'll recognize them all over the place. You'll understand why they were so adamant about, you know, uh, putting these things before us, these truths before us, because they are foundational and pivotal, because they allow us to transition from the age of darkness to the age of light. Right, the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts, as Peter puts it. Right, because we will have attained a like faith as they had at the beginning. Uh, Yeshua says in the Gospel of Thomas, "Have you, uh, if you seek for the end, have you found the beginning? Because the end is at the beginning. That means it's encoded to be decoded. Once the encoding is the same as the decoding, see, the end is the same as the beginning. Once you understand, when, you know, once you're catching what they're pitching, in other words, then that whole." intervening age of confusion or whatever just goes away because you are at the beginning when you find the end and vice versa because um, again he calls the end from the beginning right so you understand things are spoken in prospect to be understood in retrospect just like it was at first they spoke about the prophecy of the coming of Yeshua 
And then once they saw that, all of those those prophecies were understood retrospectively. But Yeshua spoke prophecies as well. And in the Old Testament, again, there were three items in the Ark of the Covenant. There were always meant to be three revelations. And so there were three dispensations, and Yeshua speaks of one to come. The Comforter will come. Elijah will come, right? Etc. He's talking about things that are going to happen. Uh, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of him. So he promises things in the future. So this is the deliverance of that. Yeah. And so now that you're at the deliverance of those promises, again, the wisdom is poured out like water, and glory faileth not before him forevermore. Because again, he's opening up <laughs> the secrets of the righteous of righteousness. And again, unrighteousness shall disappear as a shadow and have no continuance. Again, a shadow is kind of an illusion. It doesn't exist. You can't pick it up. You know, you can't move it. It's just there. You know, uh, it's 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 not. It's there, but it's not there. It's just a. It's just an illusion. Uh, it's a function of the where the light doesn't shine. Um, so, but because the elect one standeth before the Lord of the spirits again. In Luke, he is referred to as the elect one. In the book of Enoch, he's spoken of as the elect one. And in Luke, at um, his transfiguration, God himself speaks out of heaven and says, you know, this is my son, the elect one, right? right? Hear right. ye him, right? So again, he's spoken of by, by Luke in this context. He stands before the Lord of the spirits. And again, the Lord of the spirits in Luke, you know, says to listen to him. And his glory is forever and ever. Because again, once you contemplate that the end was spoken from the beginning, you see, the idea is that he that everything is laid before him is predetermined and, and understood. And he spoke the end from the beginning in order to create a demonstration, if you will, to us of his eternity. Because it is his eternity that you see in his ability to have mastery over what men think and have them thinking the wrong way, right? Because he understands man. He doesn't, he doesn't need for people to tell him what is in a man. He understands man, right? Yeah. And he understands that they're going to take the bait. He, they understand that they're going to take and try and reduce him to the level of the flesh, right? But by couching the higher level understanding and the lower level of the fleshly expression of the word, then that, that holiness is still contained within that word as a seed to be extracted, if you will, or to be revealed at some future time. And so you begin to see the eternity in, in his plan. And again, his might unto all generations, because you see he was able to pull this off. Here we are at the end of time, and it's just exactly what he called from the beginning. Um, and in him dwells the spirit of wisdom and the spirit which gives insight and the spirit of understanding and of might. And the spirit of those who have fallen asleep in righteousness. And he shall judge the secret things. Again, what are some of these secret things? Like we were talking about that earlier. Well, well okay, so if it was of these men that Enoch prophesied, right? Well, one thing that we know is that Enoch was opposed and was destroyed, right? The book of Enoch. Yeah, the book of Enoch, right? And it was essentially by these men, right? The men who have crept in unawares, right? And he says some rather nasty things, and Peter does too about these men. You can read it. Their, their wild ways of the sea, he compares them to Balaam, he compares them to um, just all kinds of things. You know, they're, they're you know, uh, clouds without rain, you know, they are... Uh, wild ways of the sea, foaming up their own shame. He, he speaks in a very pejorative terms about these people, right? But what it is is that these men infiltrated the church and got rid of these teachings. And what Peter, who is the chief apostle, is te he's teaching us is that the apostles did teach the book of Enoch and these men did not, right? And that's when you get to that realization, you understand that these men have been set up. It says that in 2 Peter 2, he knows how to hold the righteous, right, as well as the wicked, right? He knows how to do this. And now that you know how that he did it, how he did it, then you can, you can clearly see that he's done it, right? And so it starts to be a matter of seeing and recognizing his power, right? It has very little to do with what you think or what you believe anymore. You, you've gone from being... You know, I believe this because it sounds right to me, or it seems right to me, or you know, have some subjective feeling about it. I accept it. My friends don't, or whatever. 
But objectively, what Peter is telling you that is that this was a teaching of the apostles. We went out and told you about the power and the coming. We went out and said to the rest of the world out there that, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. He's saying that. But he's saying that in a way that can only be understood through the Spirit. But it gives you the sense of how it is that these things disappear, and how it is that their power disappears, and how it is that the whole illusion goes away as a shadow, because you see it, right? And so we are on that day in the in the calendar. So is it some coincidence or something? These things have been treasured up for us. Yeah, you know, and we have stumbled upon their labors, right? This is the treasure hidden in the field, which is the earth, right? The earthly understanding contains the heavenly treasure, right? So you see the visual, right? Um, it was a, he will judge the secret things and elect one stands. Um, yeah, none shall be able to utter a lying word before him. Uh, for he is the elect one before the Lord of spirits according to his good pleasure. Uh, and in those days a change shall take place for the holy and the elect, and the light of days shall abide upon them, and his honor and, and glory shall turn to the holy. On the day of affliction, on which evil shall have been treasured up against the sinners, and the righteous shall be victorious in the name of the Lord of spirits, and he will cause the others to witness this, that they may repent and forego the works of their hands. And they shall have no honor through the name of the Lord of spirits, yet through his name he shall be saved. So in other words, he's made this for the believer and the non-believer as well. He's made it for the worthy and the unworthy as an opportunity to see the truth and to either accept or reject it. Uh, but they do have a chance for salvation because it, again, is objective. In other words, if you're able to um, transcend your beliefs, you can see that objectively the writing is on the wall, so to speak. Right? That this is something that has happened. Right? And so he says, I shall cause the others to see this, right? That is to say the unbelievers, right? He's made, it, he's made it possible for people who do not believe in God to nonetheless uh, come to accept his existence by means of objectivity. People always say, well, if God wants us to know him, right, why doesn't he just show himself? You know, as a former atheist, that's what I used to kind of think too, right? And it would be no great shakes for him to just show himself to everybody, and then everybody would believe him. You know what I'm saying? It seemed like a kind of way, you know, the way, you know, he would show himself. But he's showing himself through his power and his might. And in such a way that you can understand his eternity by means of the flesh, so that you understand that he is Lord of the flesh as well as the Lord of the spirits. You see what I'm saying? He has mastery over both. So he's not like he's other. He's in the flesh, but he transcends the flesh, right? He's in a body, but he transcends the body. He's in each and every one of us, and we are transcendent essentially through him if we believe him, right? And on that day, this, this day that we are in, when the truth is revealed, then we will see with our spiritual eyes, hear with our spiritual ears, understand with our spiritual heart, because again, the day has dawned, right? That's the time cue, and the morning star, again, has arisen in our hearts, right? The morning has to do with the sun coming up, the light coming up, we becoming children of the day, in other words, transitioning from children of the night. Right? That has to do with our transition, and that's what this chapter's about. Uh, again, in those days, a change shall take place for the holy and elect, and the light of the days shall abide upon them, and the glory um, and honor shall turn to the holy, and on the day of their affliction, uh, shall, the evil shall have been treasured up against the sinners, and the righteous shall be victorious again in the name of the Lord of the spirits, and he will cause the others to witnesses that they may repent, and forgo the works of their hands. So there's going to, become a, there's going to come a repentance where we're going to change our trajectory. We're no longer going to believe the authorities. And this goes for the earthly authorities as well. You see the fall of Babylon. Nobody buys their merchandise anymore. In other words, we're not willing to participate in their commerce. And we're not willing to transact according to their rules anymore. We have, we have changed and we have become different. Um, and it says, the Lord of Spirits will have compassion on them, for his compassion is great. And you can see how great his compassion is because he's made this for everybody in the whole world. Uh, and he is righteous also in his judgment. And in the presence of his glory, unrighteousness shall not maintain itself. Again, the lie is going to fall. You know, it's going to it's going to pass away. And at his judgment, the unrepentant shall perish before him. So, the, in other words, it's only those who fail to repent, only the people who stubbornly want this world in this way and will not change. Then it's a stubborn refusal of the spirit at that point. And at that point, they will perish. But for everybody else who he will give a chance to recognize and to see this. And says, and from henceforth I will have no mercy on them, saith the Lord of Spirits. And again, this is the reason why, because 
if there are going to be three manifestations, right? We talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? And then the Future Testament, which of course is like the hidden manna, let's say, right? The apocryphal works. of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Right, because, you know, that's the stuff that these people rejected. So there were things that that they accepted and then things that they rejected, right? So the Jews re rejected some of this stuff. Christians rejected some of this stuff, but it'll all be you know, restored at that point. That's the third revelation or whatever. Um, but um, anyway, so that's the um, that's the third dispensation or whatever. That's that's what is the restoration, if you will, of the mysteries or whatever. That's what it provides us with is the ability to read these books. Um, and let me see. Let me just try to make it through this last chapter here, and maybe we can start up with ninety-two the next time. In those days shall the earth give back that which has been entrusted to it, and Sheol shall also give back that which it has received. And we have a witness in this of this in uh, the book of Revelation as well. Um, the idea um, is that how in the world has Sheol received right people or a kingdom or anything really? It's through deception, through force, right, etc. I mean, there's just a whole. That's a whole. By the way, that's how Islam grows. Yeah. Well, because <laughs> they uh, they have takia where they believe that you can mislead people for the goal of like you know like saying Islam's a religion of peace for that matter. <laughs> You know. Well, there's definitely, there's definitely, well, I mean, just as a side, obvious, you know, uh, religious uh, conquest. Um, I, you know, I don't get too off on this tangent, but the, the reason why that is, because there's Mecca in scriptures, and then there's stuff written from Medina, right? And what happened was that he spoke to them positively in these passages, right, sort of as an appeal, and then once he got away from them and over into his own element, right, then all of that stuff, he started speaking against them, right? right. And Just, what happens is, what happens is that these verses have been abrogated, right? right. But they still, they still will speak those verses to you. Right. That's to draw you in, right, so, and to gain your trust. So what happens? So I, the, the issue that I have is a matter of trust because... If you could only trust some things and not others, right? right? Just on the surface of it. I mean, I have many other disagreements with it. But if you're going to use verses deceptively, right. like saying, oh, we honor Yeshua and we honor Mary and all that. If you're going to use that deceptively, right, then essentially that's, that's, he's not a deceiver. You know? so, so, just to explain to people real quick. So Muhammad starts off in Mecca, which is you know, still the center of Islam. And uh, he tries to use peace, you know, I'm a prophet, and repent, and believe in me. They don't believe him, so he speaks peacefully to him. So he flees to Medina, and he raises an army, and he goes back and defeats them. So he had the peaceful Quran of Mecca, then he had the violent Quran of Medina, and the reality is all the, the revelations of, of Mecca were canceled out by the revelations of Medina, of Jihad, right? So the Muslims don't tell you that. They know it, but they use Yeah, it. and so those are the ones they read to you. Oh, we honor Jesus, and we honor Mary, and all that other stuff. But it's it's dissimulation, because because at least the scholars know. I don't know about the lay Muslims, but the scholars know that the abrogation has taken place. And so they're, they know that using those, those terms is misleading. But the, but the idea is that, that what Sheol owes, owes, it owes because it's gotten by illegitimate means. Yeah, it's gotten through deception, right? And so it's it's been accruing a debt, if you will, all of this time because... Well, ever since the first lie at the Garden of Eden, yeah. the first deception, you will not surely die. Correct. Right, and then, yeah, so in other words, but it's but it owes because of this, right? It's in debt. It's kind of, uh, if you will, they sort of 
it sort of it sort of has to pay it back it's because like it's a temporary. In reserve it's sort of a yeah, it's sort of a temporary thing, right? They, they've kind of gone into debt, right? Uh, they didn't have to give back which it owes. But my my primary point was that Revelation says the same thing. The idea is that 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 the the, the earth gives back which it owes, and Sheol gives back with that which it owes, because the kingdom of death and the kingdom of the flesh are basically over. And now we're transitioning into children of the spirit and into the kingdom of light, right. moving away from the kingdom of darkness. And that's why it's a shadow because it's really just an illusion. And so what it owes is, is, is it owes us the truth, which it has withheld, right? And Peter, I mean, James talks about that too. Our wages have been held back, right? Um, and it's been facilitated by the church, right? Um, it says, For in those days the elect one shall arise, and he shall choose the righteous and holy from among them. Uh, for the day has drawn nigh that they should be saved. Again, the day dawns and the morning star, right? right. Now, in the book of Enoch, it seems to me that the, the term elect one is used in the same manner as the term son of man. Right? It's the same person. Yeah. yeah no, it's clearly Yeshua. I mean, it, there's, there's really no doubt about that. Um, the fact that you know, that in Luke it literally calls him the elect one. I mean, if anywhere there should have been any kind of disambiguation, it should have been there, right? But certainly it's not because they went out preaching the book of Enoch. It says, when we told you about the power and the coming, when we said, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, right? We were not following cleverly concocted fables, right? We, it's not a suit of bigger font. I mean, I don't know how much clearer it could be. It's literally saying it's not a suit of bigger font, right? And he's not... It's not for your own private interpretation, right? Prophets of old, prophets of antediluvian times, in other words, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, it is saying that in so many terms if you don't negate him. The, the trick is you don't negate them. You affirm them, right? It's the minute you start affirming the word, then you can follow the Lamb wherever he goes, right? He says, you where I'm going, you can't follow me, right? Because, in other words, I'm going to this truth over here that you can't accept. You see what I'm saying? Because I go to the Father. In other words, I'm saying things in prophecy now just as his father spoke of me, right? Now the son speaks, right? And I'm talking to you about the future coming of the Holy Spirit, right? And of course, Enoch, of course, is a prophet of old. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? So the father speaks of him. The son gives prophecies of his own, talking about, you know, um, the coming of the elect, or the, um, you know, the children that he must call the sheep, if you will, that are not of this fold, right? There's a future tense. There's a future audience. And on that day, the day dawns, in other words, the seventh day, which is where we are on the calendar, that's when all this stuff happens. And so this is why this book is relevant here and now, because this is the day, the day of salvation, and, yeah, the, and the day of judgment. Yeah. And it says, um, And the elect one uh, shall on those days sit on my throne. Right? And he also says in Revelation, by the way, he says that, you know, I will give you to sit on... Um, my throne, even my, as my father has given me to sit in his throne, right? It means that we're going to be kind of nested into each other, because that was a point I was going to try to make earlier, too, was that the reason why God said that you can blaspheme the father and you can blaspheme the son, which, again, I don't recommend it, but well, the reason why it's forgivable, right, is because if these correspond to the Old Testament, or to these dispensations, right, right, and then you have um, um, sorry, my writing is atrocious. But okay, because 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 the father that the Old Testament was sort of given to us by the Jewish people, right? And the New Testament was sort of given to us by the Christians. But Jewish, they're all Jewish except for Luke too, right? Yeah, Luke may have been. Well, I think it was a Gentile. But anyway, I uh, spoke Greek. Right, what I'm saying, every, all the writers of the, the New Testament are Jewish people, too, except for Luke. Yeah. Right. But, but the idea is that the Jews didn't preserve the truth, right? And the Christians evidently didn't preserve it either, because even though it's contained in Second Peter and Jude that Enoch is a prophet and that he's ancient and all that, they've, they've taught against it. Then He's not a prophet. He's a, it's a pseudo, pseudo figure font, right? Sure. So they've negated it, right? He's not the seventh from Adam. This is third century B.C., Right? You know, they've negated it systematically. So when these people taught you about the sun, it was these people, right? And these people aren't exactly clean. You know what I'm saying? And again, I'm not trying to 
this is not being me being anti-Christian. I'm talking about the deception. And the same with the Jews, right? He even talks about that in Revelation, the synagogue of Satan, right? Because they're going to have an undue influence on nascent Christianity, right? But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a blasphemy in the full light of the knowledge, right? Which is not forgivable in heaven, which is why, of course, the angels couldn't be forgiven. And it's not in this world or in the world to come, right? Because, again... To do it in this world, because these people, like, when the people, when you talk about these men, right, these are the people who were opposing Enoch, right? These are the people who were saying he wasn't ancient. These are the people who were saying he wasn't prophetic, right? So what he's essentially saying is because these people have brought it to you in their way, and it seemed, you know, wrong to you, that's because it was presented to you by them and in the wrong way. And so if you blaspheme against the scriptures as we have them and we know them up to this point, it's just kind of understandable. At least it's forgivable. But when you when you willfully turn your back against the truth, that's when it becomes unforgivable, right? So that means that that means that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, in effect, can't be forgiven. Um, and again, his mouth shall pour forth all the secrets of wisdom and counsel, for the Lord of spirits hath given them to him and hath glorified him. And in those days shall the mountains leap like rams, and the hills shall also skip like lambs satisfied with milk. And again, the mountains, again, are the kingdoms and the, and the great men of this earth because they're, you know, high places, like great men would be in high places or great kingdoms would be in high places. And the hills, again, lesser kingdoms, you know, whatever. Um, and, for, um, and the faces of all the angels in heaven shall be lighted up with joy, and the earth shall rejoice, and the righteous shall dwell upon it, and the elect shall walk thereon. So again, that's us, that's, that, that's us transitioning from this world into the next, from the age of man, which is this 6,000 years, to the millennium, which is 1,000 years. Um, so again, um, we'll just, I guess we'll end it right there. Um, Would you get ended? Are you uh, able to start the next chapter? Um, well, I mean, we can do that next time. I, I'm just skipping over a lot and um, moving over to the book of Enoch after that, which is the last section. Um, in the book, um, and it talks about more about what that day is going to be like, how our transition is actually going to shake out, how we're actually going to do it. We'll hit that next time. All right. Um, transition the worship service. Good job, Brother Robert. Just want to mention really quick. Uh, I was talking about this last time. This is patristics, right? which is the, uh, the writings of the early church fathers. Like we have this Messianic Jewish Christian Seder from Melito of Sardis. And he's writing, you know, it's interesting. It's around, around the year 150, 160. So uh, one of the oldest manuscripts we have the, of the Bible contains the book of Barnabas in the New Testament. And Barnabas quotes from the uh, the book of Enoch as if it is scripture. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'll, we have a Tertullian of Carthage. And at his time, he's writing, like I said, from year 180 to 220. He's saying that, you know, some people re reject the book of Enoch because the Jewish people rejected it. And he thinks the reason why they re rejected it is because of the Messianic prophecies. Because it talks about, he's pre-Christian, right, before the before you should came to, into the flesh, and yet it has prophecies of them which are very specific, as we mentioned. Uh, but it's also very interesting. We have um, Justin. He used to be called Justin the philosopher, but he became Justin Martyr, right? And he was a early Christian apologist. He also died around the year 160. And he's uh, in his apologies advocating for the truth of of Christianity. As an apologist, you know the, the term apologist. What that means? Explainer. Apollo. Oh. Just. <laughs> who's, who's, who's an who's an apologist that you know? Think of some famous Christian apologists. Uh, uh, yeah, Athenagoras is someone else who used. He's writing around the early early period. He's also one uh, thirties. And doesn't it have an implication of? Defender of a certain point of view. Right, we need that, right? You got a lot of people that have valid, you know, there's blasphemers and scorners, but we also have people that have valid questions. 
And even in the face of blasphemy, we have an answer, right? Yeah. Say so you got Richard Dawkins. This has been a few years ago. You had the New Atheist Movement. And we need to respond to that, right? We need to have Christian scholars silencing the mouths of not just the blasphemers, the scorners, and the scoffers, but sometimes people are legitimately confused and have uh, legitimate questions. questions, right? And we need to... Um, C.S. Lewis, he got he, he was involved in Christian apologetics. Yeah. I like what C.S. Lewis did because he engaged the culture and the right. arts right. through the screw tape letters, through Narnia, right? Let's go in there and if if you understand, basically the line of which the wardrobe is a parable right. about salvation, the whole thing. Uh, so we need to be engaging the world in that. But he also wrote uh, Mere Christianity, which. Simple Christianity, basically, or basic Christianity. So he went on to, you know, he would give debates, and we need to do that sometimes as well. Um, now, interestingly, Justin Martyr, he he was the teacher of Tatian the Assyrian. He was also a uh, he was also a Christian apologist, and he produced what's called the Diatessaron, which is the first harmony of the four Gospels. This is also around the year 150. So what we see is. During the second century, almost all the prominent <coughs> leaders of the church are using Enoch. Yeah, I mean, and, and these are these are big names: Justin yeah. Martyr, mm -hmm. Tertullian of Carthage, uh, and you know Barnabas and, Ath and uh, Athenagoras, uh, Irenaeus even, yeah. and and which we have with Irenaeus is we had John. And John had a, 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 a disciple named Polycarp. Right. And then Polycarp, according, you know. It sounds like a mathematical term. Yeah. But Irenaeus, Irenaeus himself says, I was instructed by Polycarp, and Polycarp was destruct, instructed by John. And we also have, you know, there's an epistle of Polycarp. Polycarp. So, you know, this is direct apostolic witness. Like, uh, like, like, and then they repressed some of the things the early church was doing. The later church repressed so effectively, like the diatessaron existed in uh, in Greek and, and in Aramaic. It doesn't exist in those languages anymore, to my knowledge, especially Aramaic, the original. I just, it's amazing how how effective they were. You know, just burning books. Gotcha. And uh, they had to have had the book of Enoch in Aramaic because, like I was mentioning, uh, uh, Manny, the, you know, the, the father of Manichaeism, he was using, he canonized the, one of the books of Enoch. So he, he grew up as an Aramaic baptizing Christian is what he, what he was started off as. He was familiar with the book of Enoch. But it doesn't exist in Aramaic anymore. No. So the diatessaron has gone, the book of Enoch. It only survived in its entirety. This manuscript, what I was mentioning with this Passover uh, Seder, it's, you know, it's got a part of the, the first part of the book of Enoch. The rest of the manuscript's gone. It's missing. Uh, but they did a they did a good job. And I mean, it's, it's kind of there's a lot of other works that I'll, I'll give you. An, I'll give you another example. There's this guy called uh, Papias uh, of uh, Heropolis, right? So he goes, we got like five less than that, probably four pages out of this thing. And he goes, you know, all the apostles are dying off, so. I decided to go and interview the last remaining apostles. I want to talk to people who the apostles and write, you know, what they had to say. And uh, like I said, we only got four pages. <laughs> That'd be fascinating to read, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, the church fathers quoted a, a section, large section, so we got the four or five pages. But that book is was just disappeared. Yes. So it's amazing to see much lost uh, lost literature from the early church period. But and we, you know, it's interesting to look also what we do have. So. Uh, Brandon, could you close us out in a word of prayer? Yes, sir. Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask the forgiveness of all many sins done and unknown. If we sin and we're against you, please show us and let us repent. We thank you for all that is said and done during the Sabbath school service and worship service. Please do. Be used to bring honor and glory to your name and benefit your kingdom. Please dwell among us, Holy Spirit, and just come move and just move upon us. We thank you for all your many blessings. In Shalom and Sheik's name, I pray. Amen and amen. 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 Amen.